as we consider this, I want us to consider our awesome God. I want you to take just a moment, uh, especially those of you who are saved a little later in life, this will be a little bit easier for you, but I want you to contemplate and think about the day you got saved, the day you trusted Christ as Savior. What was happening in your life that that took place? Was it in a church? Was it in a service? Was somebody coming to visit you? Uh, just this past week in New Hampshire, where Diane and I are headed for our grandson's graduation soon, um, in New Hampshire, my daughters, our daughter and son-in-law's uh, church had missionaries in. And just how small the Christian community was, I want you to know that some... 51 years ago, this young man was on the island of Okinawa and he knocked on the door of an apartment of which Diane and I stayed in. I was at work, she was at home, and what he was doing was mapping out for their visitation teams all the nooks and crannies of Okinawa. Okinawa at that time had one street and a whole bunch of alleys, nothing else, just one road and alleys. Oh, it was fun. I, when I first got there, I had to drive a 60-passenger school bus. Yeah. Uh, the Okinawans were on strike, so we had to do what we had to do. But anyways, I come home, and I see this young man good-looking young man, talking to my wife. And I'm unsaved as unsaved can be. And boy, I let him know real quick it was time for him to go. I had no idea what he was doing, nor did I care, because what I saw, I did not like. But that was the seed that was planted in my wife's life so that soon... She trusted Christ as Savior, which totally changed our marriage. My daughter goes, no, that can't be. And I go, the name's spelled the same way. I think it could be. So she went and asked, and he said, well, yeah, I was there before I went to college. And yeah, so... But what was happening to you? What was happening in your life? Just take a moment to contemplate that. How did God work in your life? What do you praise him for today besides the salvation you receive? Have you got it? Have you got something? If you got something, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Uh, little did you know, you were the service tonight. Uh, who wants to be first? No? Okay, I'm just kidding anyways. Well, I want you to think about it. Here the Ninevites are evil, wicked people. As Eric has already described, they violently overthrew Israel. They violently overthrew Israel because it was part of God's judgment in their lives. Because they would not repent from their idolatrous ways. And our awesome God is so awesome, he wants to take this group of people, evil, wicked, idolatry, sin that is so crazy, and he yearns for them to hear this message 40 days, that's what you got. You're gonna be destroyed 40 days. That's what you got, only 40 days. And in the back of their mind, they might have heard things about Sodom, Gomorrah, maybe even the flood. You know, they had heard things, I am sure, of how God provided for the children of Israel and brought victory after victory for them. 
And as we look at this, and especially verse 5 and verse 10, and let me repeat verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Well, what was God doing? May I share with you that God is being faithful. God is being faithful. He is so faithful. He was committed to have his message be declared to the Ninevites. He had to get Jonah's attention a second time to be able to do what God wanted him to do. You and I have been charged to share the gospel. You know, you and I have been uh, charged to be good stewards of the gospel. The reality is our God is still faithful. He yearns for his message to be proclaimed. And what a better time in America and across the world for that message to be proclaimed, for it to go out boldly. Yeah, Christ came and he said his message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That is what John started with. That is what the Lord uh, continued on in his earthly walk. And that's what he yearns for you and I to share today. The kingdom of God is at hand. You know, and we could be in those last days. But wouldn't it be great if God brought a great revival across America? Wouldn't it be wonderful to watch thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ so that when the rapture happened, wow, what a vacuum would be in the world. What a vacuum would be in America. He is faithful. You know, I remember reading in 1 Thessalonians 5, he who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. You know, he yearns for us to take the message to the nations, to all nations. It doesn't matter who and where they are. It doesn't matter what sin they're trapped in and ensnared in. God is faithful. Just as he yearned to have the word go to the Ninevites, he yearns for you and I to do the same. Psalm 119 verse 138 says, Your testimonies, which you have commanded, are righteous and very faithful. His word is faithful. He has promised you and I that it would not return to him void. That he will always take when you and I share, when you and I meditate on, when you and I allow it to be plunged deep in our hearts and lives to allow it to bring fruit to his glory, whatever that fruit might be. You know, I think about uh, when I did get saved some years later, the reality of, huh, I don't like to read. And at the time, uh, my Bible was probably three times the size of this Bible. They wanted to make sure I had God's word. It was big. And, uh, you know, just reading and sharing God's word... And he tells us that his word is not burdensome. Do we believe that? And do we have a love and a desire to get to know how faithful God is throughout all the scriptures and the wonder of it? You know, I am convinced that you and I could not go four pages in whichever Bible you own and you read through that you will not see the faithfulness of our great God. He is faithful. He yearned for it to happen. He desired for it to happen. He proclaimed that it should happen. He proclaimed that he yearned to have Jonah do the work to be the servant of God, to declare this, even though he balked. God is faithful. Do you relish the faithfulness of God in your life? I want you to know the day I trusted Christ as Savior, I could think of not only his faithfulness today to save a wretch like me, but his faithfulness to use his people 
to bring it to pass. The pastor who was preaching and he taught on um, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the Holy Spirit had it make sense in my heart and life that day and that day I repented of my sin, trusted Christ as Savior. Um, I lost touch of him. He was an itinerant speaker at the time. Uh, when he was 90, he was still alive and living in Minnesota and I found his email address and I just had to thank him, even though it was years later, thank him for being a faithful servant, faithful to God's word, faithfully trusting the faithfulness of God in his own life. How do you, you and I do? Do we really trust the faithfulness of God? Do we see how faithful he is? Do we really believe 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which says no temptation has overtaken us except which is common to man, but God is faithful and will not allow you and I to be tempted beyond what we are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You and I, if we trust the faithfulness of God, you know, we wouldn't be so easily overtaken by sin in our personal walk with God. Why? Because he is faithful. He is faithful through that Holy Spirit to prick our conscience to where we can go. Hmm. Psalm 119 also says, your faithfulness, O Lord, endures to all generations. It hasn't stopped and he won't stop. He won't stop with my generation. He won't stop with whatever generation you might be in. Uh, and the reality is, God is faithful. Amen? And that is what is happening here. God's faithfulness is being revealed. His holiness is being revealed. God is holy. And we all know what that means. You know, the fact that he is completely set apart from sin. There is no sin in him at all. He's never been tempted by sin or in any way, shape, form, or manner. You know, and when you look at this, I want us to understand that God is not fickle when it comes to wickedness and evil. He, he will overthrow it. It doesn't matter who or what country, who is delivering it, he will overthrow it. Nineveh, you know, they had to respond to God's holiness, his righteousness, if they were going to believe him, to have faith in him. They believed God. Not just that they were going to get whooped, but that he was a way of salvation from that condemnation and judgment. You and I, <laughs> we were all under condemnation, were we not? You know, that's where that John 3, 17 and 18 comes in. I just love it. We all love John 3, 16, which declares wonderfully this truth. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten son of God. They believed they believed that God could make a difference in their situation that they found him in. Otherwise, God wouldn't have done what he did. The reality of who God is, his holiness. It is written in God's word for you and I to be holy because he is holy. It is to be something that truly impacts our lives from the day we recognize we are a sinner to the day we go home to meet him wonderfully, whatever way that is. His holiness. Do we take his holiness for granted because we take his grace for granted? 
How do we reveal, how do we respond to the holiness of our God? He's never going to change from being holy. Yeah, we're all sinners saved by grace or sinners waiting to be saved by grace or sinners that are stiff-arming God and will never be saved by grace. That names all of us here. The wonder is, you know, when I come around the table, that's one thing that my heart is always drawn to, the holiness of God. That's why my Savior died on the cross, to satisfy the holy righteousness of God on my behalf, his holiness. Now, you might be sitting there and and just thinking about his holiness is something that we shouldn't take for granted, but it's something because of our sin nature that sometimes we do take for granted. We rebel, we sin, do something foolish, have to repent again. But man, if it could be a character trait of God that would be indelibly imprinted on our hearts so that moment by moment, day by day, we have a faithful, holy God that we worship, that we adore, that we praise. You know, as you see the Ninevites believing God, I want us to understand, and I'm going to use one of those omni words right now, just how omniscient God is. God is omniscient. He is not just faithful. He is not just holy. He is omniscient. He knows exactly what is going on in their hearts and lives. Individually, in that moment, at that time, whether or not they were sincere and true in what was happening in their life. Were they putting on a facade, you know, or were they being genuine, pleading to God, God, please do something different rather than overthrow us, destroy us. We know you will do that. Would you consider something else. Right now, he knows every one of our hearts here, what we're thinking, what we're doing, you know, whether we're still thinking, oh man, wasn't that a great worship song? Why did Billy stop? Why did they stop and put this old guy up there? You know, or are we really contemplating how great and awesome our God is? How wonderful he is. He knows He knows what you and I do 24-7, 365, 366 days a year, depending on which year it is. He knows. He knows where our heart goes in those quiet moments of frustration, (laughs) in those loud moments of declaration of frustration. He knows. Do we respond to the fact that he is that all-knowing in your life, my life? It shouldn't intimidate us. You know why? For the present-day Christian, a true believer in Christ, you aren't and I are indwelled by someone. Who is that? The Holy Spirit of God. God himself dwells within us. So the fact that he knows everything, the reality is therefore we should not desire to grieve or quench that spirit of God that is within us. Why? Because we know he knows everything that's happening within us. And it should be something that motivates us to want to glorify him and all that we do motivate us to do all that he calls us to do. To be able to hear that voice. Eric mentioned I was on staff for 10 years. About 11, 11 and a half years ago, we had chosen RMC as a place to worship. Uh, And I will share with you, if you didn't already know this, I had already retired from ministry uh, from the back northeast and uh, had 
relocated out here to be next to family. Uh, I was working in a machine shop, and at that time, I was working 12-hour days, and it was a stinky job I had. Um, I ran a 12 by 20 foot water jet. It's a big machine. Uh, at that time, I was cutting specialty steel uh, with it uh, for a heavy metal guitarist who was building a $10 million home up in Aspen, and he wanted the whole downstairs decor and the stairway to be black heavy metal. And that's what they bought. That's what I'm cutting to go in his home. And we had a time pressure on it, so I was doing 12-hour days, uh, 6 to 6. Uh, I told Diane that day, I'll meet you at, ch at church. And we came in, and because I was really stinky, uh, we chose to sit in the back, not up front. Uh, and, you know, I was sitting beside myself and beside myself, and I really didn't mind if Diane didn't sit near me. Uh, I was bad that day. Really, really, it was a bad day. I was covered with junk. And Eric was teaching first, he was introducing first and second Timothy, and he talked about Timothy's relationship with Paul and Paul's relationship with Timothy, and I, you know, and just doing a great job like he always does. You know, you can just tell us the Holy Spirit. And I'm sitting there going, and all of a sudden, I hear this thought. Uh, Rich, what have I called you to do? And I sat there and I go, well, well wait a minute. <laughs> well, that, that season's over. Where'd that weird thought come from? That's gone. You know, that season of pastoring is over. You know, and whoo. I am tired, you know, and all of a sudden, it wasn't five minutes later, and the Lord says, Rich, what have I equipped you to do? Ah. And at that moment, my heart was crushed before God, and I knew I had to respond to the word of God. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He knows where we are at. Now, I had no clue in that moment that it would be, I'd be invited to be on staff here and anything like that, but I knew I had to get into the ministry again because that is what God had called me and equipped me to do for his glory. God is not only omniscient, he is so gracious. Now, think about it. If they are repenting, what is God going to do? If God knows their hearts and they are truly broken in a broken and contrite spirit, what can God do? Can God extend his grace to them in such a way that they get this favor that they do not deserve before a holy God? They believed God. The decision is his now. Do I be gracious to this people? In the book of Colossians, we would read this, that Christ and... Uh, since we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints because of the hope that is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before the word of truth and the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is among you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. They knew the grace of God in truth. They... they just being forgiven would have been sufficient for them. I am convinced of that. The wonder of who God is. I don't know about you, but I still marvel at the grace of God in my own personal life. That he pours it out so freely in our hearts and lives. Romans 5, 1 through 5. And the wonder of it, the hope of our calling, the reality of all that he has given us after we are justified by faith and that we have this peace with God and that we can continually, through our faith, have access to that grace in our lives. 
Oh, woe to us if we take the grace of God for granted. Oh, I will rebel. I will do this sin. I will continue in this sin because I know God is gracious. Woe to us. Oh, he yearns to pour out and lavish us with his grace in such a way that the gospel, when it's proclaimed, just magnifies how truly magnificent he is. Have you ever traveled behind a vehicle and you know that, man, they've had a rough encounter with God somewhere along in their lives? I followed somebody recently and one of the bumper stickers was, nothing fails like prayer. And I go, oh. Prayer should be something where we just place ourselves right in the center of God's grace in our lives where we relish this relationship with our true and holy God who who has brought about something magnificent in our lives. So gracious. I want you to know, I, I was a wicked wretch when God saved my soul. That is God's grace. It is also his mercy. Man, God had a number of years to pour out his judgment on my life. The Ninevites are going to experience just how merciful God is, not getting what they deserve. The Ninevites would not receive God's judgment in that moment. Now, how do you respond to that? Oh, wait a minute. I know how Jonah responds to it, and Eric will pick up on that again this weekend. But how do we respond to it? You know, a number of you know who have heard me speak have told you that I just had a root of bitterness towards my biological dad. We hadn't talked in a long time. We had a horrible earthly relationship. Uh, He's in his late 60s. His health was failing. And I was thinking, as a Christian, it's okay, Lord. Take him anytime, you know, kind of thing. And he was my Nineveh, literally. I didn't want to share the gospel with him. But just like Jonah, my faithful God backed me into a corner and spit me out, so to speak, to where I knew I cannot do anything else but go to my dad several states away and share with him the gospel of truth. And I want you to know, as I went, I was convinced of this one thing. He hates God so bad that he isn't going to respond. He's just going to spit nails at me and curse me and everything else about okay God I'll go and we went and I shared and this is about as close a perfect quote of the conversation I had with my dad there he hated talking politics he hated talking religion of any kind I stood there and I said, Dad, I got something important to tell you. I'm going to ask you to forgive me. I know I was rotten to the core. I've treated you rottenly my whole life. I don't like you. But I want you to forgive me. And I want you to know I forgive you of everything. Everything. This is a blanket forgiveness for every rotten thing that you did to me in my life. And the only reason why I can do this, Dad, is because Jesus Christ has forgiven me. Boy, he snapped his head away from me so fast, I'm thinking, the explosion is about ready to happen. And he turned back to me, and he goes, what? What are you trying to say? And I go, no, thank you, Lord. I got to say it again. (laughs) 
And I told him again, I begged for his forgiveness for all my rottenness. I forgave him again for everything that he had done. And I proclaimed again, and I go, Dad, the only way I can do this is because Jesus Christ has forgiven me everything. There was a third thing God hated, and that is when men cry. And the second time going through it, I'm crying like a baby, asking my dad to forgive me, and that I forgave him. And boy, when he snapped his head back towards me, he was crying. And he goes, do you think God could forgive me? And I go, now I could have played a Jonah, sure. Rather than rejoicing, I said, what? <laughs> I go, what? And he goes, do you think God can forgive me? Oh boy, he's in the business of doing that. Yes, he can. And I opened up God's word. I shared with him. My son, who is about 10 years old, is standing there. And he's just going, what's happening? <laughs> and his grandfather there prays to receive Christ as his Savior and ask God to forgive him his sin. Do you see how gracious and merciful God is? You and I should never, ever forget that. The reality of our position before we believed and truly trusted, the reality of our life in him every step of the way. God is so merciful. A matter of fact, Christ himself told the Pharisees, you know, I did not come to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. The reality of his mercy. Ephesians 2 says, God who is rich in mercy mm, because of his great love. That's the next thing I want us to consider. Our God's unconditional love. There will not be a moment in this man's life where I deserve God's love. And yet he pours it out my life continuously and steadfastly because of who he is. Unconditional love. I could not do anything to deserve the Ninevites <laughs> they certainly wouldn't, weren't able to do anything to deserve God's love. When you and I walk around and think about the fact that somebody gets saved from whatever background of life, and we put our hands in our pockets and go, sure, how long will this last? We're being foolish. We ought to come running alongside of them in their brokenness and yearning for them now to start taking those steps of faith because he is faithful and how he yearns to grow them in his grace for them to consistently receive his love in their life to where they experience his love in their life. Man, I'm so thankful that God put myriads of servants in my life that just poured out God's love into my life to help me grow. Mentoring, discipling, encouraging, going, going, going because of who he is. You know, we read in 1 John 4 that God is love. And with that... He also encourages you and I to love one another because he is love. You know, and I want you to know if God is willing to love this unlovable guy, oh man, how much more should I want to pass that love on and be that conduit of God's love into other people's lives so that he can make a difference in their lives. The Ninevites, they deserve justice, condemnation, judgment, destruction, every single way. But they believed God. Verse 10, it says, God saw 
the works, the works in their heart, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented. God didn't change his mind here. I hate it when people say that. He changed his mind. No. The people changed their hearts. Through the wonderful power of the Holy Spirit, I imagine, their hearts magnificently changed. They recognized God. They recognized him for all that he is. And their position changed so God could only do what he does because he cannot deny himself because he is a just God and respond to their repentance his way. He is just He didn't change his mind at all. He's still God. He's still pouring out everything into their lives. Uh, Aren't you glad that you've been justified by faith? Declared righteous before a holy God. The wonder of who he is. You know, I don't know where you are in your relationship with God or you folks online. But boy, how I yearn for you to see God's faithfulness, his holiness, his omniscience, his graciousness, his mercy, his true unconditional love. And would you respond to that today? He loves to forgive sinners. Hmm. He yearns to see the righteousness of his son put to your account from this day forward if you have not trusted Christ as Savior. Oh, right there where you're seated. Just call out to God and say, God, forgive me. I know I'm a sinner and I trust Jesus Christ alone. Your son is my savior. I repent of my sin. Oh, save me and be the Lord of my life. Then come and truly celebrate communion. And after you celebrate communion, Go and talk to one of the pastors and tell them what you've done. Maybe you're here today and you've wandered away from God. I want you to know all those attributes of God, they're still true and real and available for you. He just desires that broken heart, that repentance, Mm. so that he could be magnified in your life. For those of us who think that we're walking pretty good right now in our walk with God, let's go sharing the reality of who he is and the wonder of his love. Diane and I are going to embark on an adventure, and I'm already praying for open doors with strangers to share, to share, to share. Because I want you to know Nothing is as powerful as genuine prayer. Mm. And what a difference if you and I just took those seven, and there's many more in this passage that could be highlighted and declared about how great our God is. But if we just took those seven and day in and day out, kept them before our heart and our mind and watch our our attitudes and our actions and how they would change in this life and how we would be filled with compassion for those we meet. As Billy comes and let's stand and pray and let's consider how great and awesome our God is tonight. And feel free to come and celebrate communion. Our Father and our God, you know each and every one of our hearts. You know where we're at. Lord, how I pray that each one of us would be celebrating the wonder 
of all that you are, your faithfulness, your holiness, your omniscience. Ah, man, your grace, your mercy, your unconditional love. The wonders of salvation. And might we truly walk in praise and celebrate? Might we yearn? Might we even be burdened to share that truth with others? And be amazed and excited about how great you are. Oh, Father, we love you. Thank you for this opportunity of worship. Please meet every need in every heart and life here, as well as those online, through your riches and glory, through Christ our Lord, in whose name I pray. Amen.